I'm standing on Green Hill in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Today, it's a quiet residential neighborhood. But 350 years ago, a company of 80 Massachusetts militiamen fought for their lives here against an army of Native American warriors determined to destroy them. I have a special interest in this battle because it was fought just a few miles from where I grew up, in Wayland, Massachusetts. For the past several years, I've been fascinated by King Philip's War, but when I was a kid, I had no idea a battle was fought in my hometown. And it's no wonder. There are only a handful of poorly maintained historical markers commemorating the Sudbury fight, most of which were put up in the 1930s and reflect an old-fashioned pro-English bias. It's about time the story of this battle was retold. The Sudbury fight was one of the climactic battles of King Philip's War. From June 1675 to August of 1676, a native coalition waged brutal war against the English colonists of this region. King Philip's War was the bloodiest war per capita in American history, with heavy military and civilian losses on both sides. The Sudbury fight is an obscure battle in a frankly obscure war but it was the last victory the Algonquin people would ever enjoy over the English colonists encroaching on their ancestral homelands. In April 1676, New England was in chaos. Widespread Indian raids on English towns have devastated the colonies. That spring, in Massachusetts Bay, several frontier villages were abandoned. A small garrison maintained Marlborough as a military outpost, but even so, towns like Concord and Sudbury remained extremely vulnerable to attack. So colonial authorities sent Captain Samuel Wadsworth and about 50 militiamen to reinforce the frontier. Wadsworth arrived in Marlborough late in the evening on April the 20th. Before dawn on April 21st, a large force of around 500 native warriors infiltrated Sudbury. They were probably under the joint command of Mudawamp, Sachem of the Nipmuc, and Metacomet, Sachem of the Wampanoag, who whites called King Philip. But the people of Sudbury had expected an attack. This is all the remains of the Haynes Garrison House. Garrison houses were large fortified buildings where settlers would hole up during times of emergency. When rumors began circulating about an impending Indian attack, several residents of Sudbury abandoned their homes and took refuge in the Haynes Garrison House. The colonists who were ensconced here must have woken up that morning, bleary eyed, looked out the windows, and what they saw terrified them. Here, just where the road is today, were several dozen ferocious Nipmuc and Wampanoag warriors silently waiting for the signal to attack. And attack they did, with volleys of arrows and musket balls. The Sudbury fight was on. But fortunately for the English, the Haynes Garrison House was an extremely good defense. I mean, it was built for exactly this type of attack. The second story had actually armored walls. And what I mean by that is that there was a wall of brick sandwiched between stout wood planking on either side. It provided excellent cover for musket fire. The men of the Haynes Garrison House would have been at the windows with their rifles. When they fired off a shot, they would hand the rifles off to the women in the back of the house, who would reload them, hand them right back, and this way, they were able to keep up a continuous rate of fire. The Haynes garrison here took fire throughout the morning. At one point, the natives filled a big wagon full of flax, set it on fire, and rolled it down this hill directly toward the house. But at the last moment, the wagon wheel hit a rock, and the whole contraption toppled over. Some historians have suggested that the Haynes Garrison attack was more of a feint than anything else, perhaps to draw the English militia into battle on ground of the native's own choosing. Whether or not that was the intention, it was certainly the result. When news of the attack on Sudbury reached Concord, 11 brave but foolish men of that town marched down here. 
Not far from this very bridge, they were ambushed by a large force of Indians and slaughtered almost to a man. Only one of the conquered men escaped with his life. Flushed with victory, the natives surged across Town Bridge and set about pillaging the central settlement of Sudbury. But shortly before noon, more effective English reinforcements arrived. Watertown militiamen under the command of Captain Hugh Mason engaged the raiding party and drove them back to the west bank of the river. As Mason was resting back control of the town, Captain Wadsworth approached from the west with 80 soldiers, his numbers bolstered by men from the Marlborough militia. Wadsworth and his troops had only a few hours rest at Marlborough before they were forced to march back east to defend Sudbury. They were hungry, exhausted, and completely ignorant of the enemy's position. As Wadsworth approached this spot, one of his men shouted the alarm. He saw a warband of about a hundred Indians darting into the trees just to the north of here. Thinking they had surprised Metacomet's rear guard, the English rashly gave chase. They pursued the natives all the way to the pass between Goodman's Hill and Green Hill, and then the Indians sprang their trap. Hundreds of warriors popped out of hiding and laid down a withering fire before swooping down from the high ground to clash with Wadsworth's militia. In a deft tactical maneuver, units of warriors moved to block off the northern and southern ends of the pass. Wadsworth's militia was surrounded. Somewhere in this general vicinity, native warriors streamed down the slopes directly at Wadsworth's men. At first, they fought well. They acquitted themselves. They were able to repulse charge after charge by the enemy. But after a couple hours of fighting, it became very clear that this position on the low ground was completely untenable. The militia fought their way through the native lines. At the top of Green Hill, they made their final stand. These hills are fairly steep. Uh, it's a bit of a struggle getting up it. Just in, in normal circumstances, uh, but I can only imagine doing this with a musket and plate armor and with a bunch of people trying to kill me. At this point, two companies of English cavalry arrived at the battle. The first, led by Captain Edward Cowell, had just narrowly escaped an ambush of their own three miles from Sudbury. The second, led by Corporal Solomon Phipps, had ridden hard all day from Charlestown to aid in the defense. The cavalry joined the Watertown militia in attempting to rescue Wadsworth. They struck the native army in its rear, but despite a valiant effort, were forced to retreat. Back at Green Hill, the battle was approaching its desperate climax. Wadsworth and his men were fighting well, but more and more of them were starting to fall. Meanwhile, Metacomet and Mudawump must have known it was only a matter of time before more English reinforcements arrived. They needed to complete their victory, and soon. So they set fire to the dry brush around Green Hill. Billowing smoke choked and panicked the English. After two exhausting marches and hours of constant fighting, Wadsworth's men finally broke and ran. The natives chased the English down the hill, falling upon them with tomahawks and swords. Wadsworth himself was killed in the retreat. <laughs> along with Captain Brocklebank of the Marlboro Garrison. All in all, 26 English soldiers died running. Of the 80 men who had marched to Sudbury's defense, only 14 survived. Wadsworth and his men are buried right here, just a stone's throw away from where they died. As night fell, the native army withdrew from Sudbury. Mary Rawlinson, an English woman who was being held captive by the Indians at this time, wrote that the mood amongst the warriors was solemn that night. They had won a great victory, but at a huge cost. By all accounts, the Wampanoag and Nipmuc had suffered unacceptable casualties. They had failed to comprehensively plunder and destroy the town, thanks to Captain Mason and the Watertown militia. The Sudbury fight was a Phyrek victory for the Native Alliance. However, on a tactical level, the Sudbury fight was extremely decisive. We don't know exactly who commanded the Native forces here. Local tradition holds it was Metacomet, but I would suggest it was Mudawump who organized the brilliant ambush between the hills. He had already shown signs of tactical genius at the Battle of Bloody Brook in 1675. Since the Indians left no written records, we might never know for sure. In any case, the Sudbury fight proves that Native American warfare in this period was not sporadic and poorly organized, as many historians have claimed. 
The feint against the Haynes garrison and the ambush of Wadsworth's men was cunning and calculated. In his own way, Mudawump may well have been the Hannibal of the Nipmuc. This is a monument to the brave militiamen who died here, but it's also a testament to the last gasp of native resistance in this region. Four months after the Sudbury fight, Metacomet would die, and with him, native hopes for victory in King Philip's War. In my opinion, the Sudbury fight should be remembered as the little bighorn of the East, the last great victory of the Algonquin people.